Good evening, and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, I think we're for a real treat, Howard Marshall, and I won't try to name all of the uh, members of the band, the nameless string band. Um, we're in for a real treat. Howard Marshall is a Missouri treasure, and uh, <laughs> I said that because his wife's here. <laughs> They're both treasures. Uh, I've known Howard, I think since we were graduate students, more than 40 years, maybe more than that. Uh, I think your first book was Folk Architecture and Water Dixie, right. and I remember that as your dissertation at the University of Indiana. But tonight, uh, Howard is gonna uh, talk and play and uh, give us a taste of his most recent book, which, uh, is here, keep it old time. We've got that book on sale. We also have all three books in the trilogy on sale tonight. I think the first one was 2013, is that right? 2012. Uh, so after they play, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask some questions. And then Howard has graciously agreed to, uh, to sign some books. Uh, if, if you're interested, come back on Saturday because our bookstore is going to be open. There'll be a dozen or so vendors here from 10 to 4, kind of our open house for Christmas. So come back and buy some Christmas gifts. But again, thank you for being here, and I heard you're on. says, that ain't old time. It is now. Um, welcome everybody to this beautiful new building that Gary Kramer has built with his own hands. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Working? Yep, yep. Thank you, Dr. Kramer, for the nice introduction. And uh, it's always great to be part of the historical society. Um, Gary reminded me once that I joined when I was in high school 
1960 when membership was five dollars a year. He reminds me of that every you know fundraising campaign that comes along. Anyhow, I'm really proud to be a member, and uh, there's a lot of my uh, collections over 30, 40 plus years of collecting traditional music and a lot of other things that are in the archives here in case you're interested. And I know some of you enjoy archival recordings of fiddlers that are long gone. And uh, so all of my collections are here, many more to come too. And there are other great collections of uh, fiddle information here as well, like the R.P. Christensen uh, collection and, uh, and many others. So it's a great place to be to know that the institution supports Missouri traditional life and traditional life and work. And uh, it's, it's just great to be here. Uh, my name is Howard Marshall. This is Richard Shoemaker on my left. And Richard is going to play the violin some tonight. Uh, he's, uh, he's one of the uh, next generations. And uh, goes, we go way back to when you got, boy, 15 years ago. <laughs> and uh, when you're still at uh, playing at Rockbridge High School Orchestra, and then I got a hold of him. And you see what happened then, you know. <laughs> And then Jim Ruth on the left, you all might know Jim. He's a, one of the great legends of the old time fiddle crew in the Columbia area. He had a legend. And the Irish music group too, as you'll hear a little bit later on this evening. To my right is David Cavins, who builds guitars like the one that he's holding here. It's for sale. Uh, he has a website. Yeah, Cavins Guitars, a master luthier, and a heck of a great player for backup guitar, which is kind of an art. Not everybody likes to play backup or even knows how to play backup, so thanks, David. Asher Ferguson, next in line here, is a young man who's a student at the university presently, a sophomore, and he's uh, been playing all of a few months, I think, maybe half a year, although he goes back to playing tenor saxophone in the, in the high school band out at Battle High. So. Uh, and he's playing some tin whistle tonight. You might notice that. You might wonder, why is a tin whistle in an old-time fiddle band? Because I like it. <laughs> and uh, I also like Asher. He's a good kid and deserves all the encouragement he can get. He's also a wonderful fiddle player and plays box a little bit too, button box, and uh, banjo, and also piano. And I haven't heard you play tenor sax, but I'm going to take it on good authority that you could play all these tunes in tenor also. Amber Gaddy is playing the uh, Titano accordion on the end, and uh, she's one of the stalwart players along with David at the Hallsville Dance. There's a big square dance every second Saturday night in the Hallsville Community Center where there's live fiddle music so you get ready to go home and a nice potluck dinner and talk to Amber and David about that. Amber is also a fiddle player and she's featured on the CD with the new book, uh, what's it called? Keep, keep it old time. And uh, so thank you, Amber, for playing the box tonight. Appreciate that. Uh, Kathy Gordon likes to hide in the back, but she's she's playing her what 1945 K bass and 43 K bass, excuse me, uh, deluxe instrument for you bass players out there. And Kathy's also one of the great. Uh, pillars of the old time music community in Columbia. Thank you so much, Kathy. Whew. Let's see, did I get all that in? Okay. And thank Margo for letting me come out tonight. <laughs> we live out in the country, it's a little bit, a little bit odd, kind of like rain when we left, and I thought, this is just exactly like when I'm in Glasgow or Dublin, except there the wind blows sideways, you know, and blows that mist right through however many layers of clothing you have on. Well, that tune we just played is called Red Wing, and I'm sure everybody here probably knows that or familiar with it. It's one of those great composed tunes from the Tin Pan Alley era in the late 1800s, early 1900s. The kind of tune that crept into the old time fiddler's repertory, but it's such a great tune and we all play it. it, it I think it's better as a two-step than a real fast tune or a couple dance of some kind, but we like playing it. And it gives us opportunity as the fiddlers to play some what we might call harmony fiddle or twin fiddle. 
which i really enjoy, especially with a first class fiddler like richard shoemaker to see me through and we'll play a few more like that tonight this is just kind of a sampler of tunes some of them are discussed in the book one or two are actually on the cd that comes with the book i might highlight the cd because in a way that stands on its own thirty five different fiddlers there ranging from nineteen sixty to two thousand and twenty two and if you take the cds that all three books have a cd all together there are ninety four different missouri fiddlers and a hundred and seven different tunes i kind of think that's an archive all by itself you know so but a lot of people buy the book and never bother to notice that there's a cd in there but david cavins would appreciate it if you noticed it because he did the engineering on it and made it happen for me i just took him boxes and grocery sacks full of old cassettes and messed up tapes and he somehow made them into a cd thank you david okay uh we're going to play a tune now just two of us just the banjo and the fiddle player jim you feel like this he has no idea how we are he says that about everything we play you know jim and uh, they're going to play arkansas traveler so you might imagine yourself in 1845 down in the arkansas hills at a camp meeting or something and here goes just fiddling banjo that up and you might pay you later <laughs> i like to hear the fiddle and banjo just by itself and i do i do mention this in really in all the books that often in the old days you know square dance would be a fiddle and banjo and that's it the rest of the band may not have made bail or something like that. <laughs> you get to the hall and you've got a banjo and a fiddle that's a band according to lester flat and the bluegrass player the band banjo player would still be there yeah I appreciate that, and that's that's one of the great classics of the fiddle and banjo repertoire. One of the first old-time fiddle tunes to be notated, American tunes in the 1830s and 40s, and uh, everybody plays it too. It's a classic, but I don't believe I've heard it quite like you guys play it today. Nice job, yeah. Um, Rick, do you want to play another one while while you're in the mood? Well, might as well. Okay, that's an old old, old tune, it's in everybody's repertoire, and so I asked Richard to play one that isn't. I like, like to kind of stir in different kinds of tunes. We often assume, you know, that, that all these fiddle tunes all percolate out of the, the mossy dales of Scotland or Ireland or West Virginia or something, but really, uh, percentage-wise, I figure out most of the fiddle tunes we play are composed by known composers if we just admit it, you know, and roll with it, it's not a problem for me. 
but this is a tune composed by a canadian fiddler in the one nine hundred fifty s called brenda's real is just someone that's on the cd oh my golly that also is on the cd with the book that you're going to buy tonight robin get ready they're going to rush you out robin's the book lady you can rush when this is over you want to talk a little bit about learning well i got my version of that tune from charlie walden and cyril stinnett who are two great missouri fiddlers cyril being one of the very best legends of missouri fiddling but other than that i can't really say much about the tune other than what you said but it's a composed tune right <laughs> it really works well for our our, our fiddling, even though it's a Canadian tune, it really works well in the uh, Little Dixie style and North Missouri style. You made a good point about Canadian fiddling. Really, Canadian fiddling is very much like Central Canada and Western Canada, especially like the style that Richard and I play, which is sometimes called a Little Dixie style or Central Missouri style. It's a little different from the way people play most tunes in the Ozarks and other parts of the country. But a lot of the Canadian tunes are played by Missouri fiddlers because if you're old enough, like me, and you're pushing 80, you might remember when you could listen to Canadian radio stations, AM stations, late at night about midnight. If your mom would let you, you'd sneak over and turn the radio on. You could hear these guys playing this amazing fiddle music in Canada. And we picked up another tune, a number of tunes that way, and they picked up tunes from us too, especially in the 1920s and 30s when WOS Radio, which, is, which was being from the dome of the state capitol in Jeff City, was a powerful radio station and was, people actually heard that station as far away as Hawaii, Cuba, and New Brunswick. So you wonder, so all the tunes are eventually from Missouri, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding, no, I think Canada has their own traditions. But we do share a lot. This is one of really one of the great, great tunes in that repertoire. Brenda's Real. played any better. Impeccable tone and taste in that. Those are things that money can't buy and many years in the 
classical world cannot give you that little sense that he gets while he's getting all the tone of a classical violinist he gets that grip and accent of an old time fiddler that's really hard to achieve i hope you appreciate it richard's one of the best in the world at it oh we are former you're a former state champion are you not oh gee oh gee junior state champion oh i think it counted just fine um do you want to play a rachel or do you want to skip on to something else okay this is a tune called rachel it's one of those tunes that we're not sure about its uh parentage i've heard people tell me that oh that's named after rachel jackson you know old hickory's wife who was quite a gal and played piano and uh that that came somehow through her i don't know i haven't been able to track this one down so and all the 65 pages of footnotes in the new book you won't find the answer to that one but we like to play it it's a considered a missouri tune now and when i play it other parts of the country you don't don't hear it too often do you there is a title called quick texas quick step is that kenny baker that calls it that or missouri quick step sometimes yeah st louis quick step yeah fiddle tunes can have a lot of different names uh, this is kind of the version that uh, i picked up i don't know maybe you know, 30 years ago from my principal mentor taylor mcbain uh here in columbia who is a marvelous old-time fiddler and a very generous man with his music he would show you and give you anything he had other teachers more stingy the great taylor is just such a gentleman you he'd just play anything and show you how to play it this is one of the really good missouri tunes i think Thank you, everybody. Uh, that was Rachel. Uh, what more can I say about it? That's probably enough to say about it. What did you learn, Rachel? Uh, 
I got it a little bit from you. I think I got a little bit. <laughs> right answer. Right answer. <laughs> no, I think that a lot of the times we pick up a lot of pieces of tunes from different people over the years. When you hear different recordings, play with different people, you end up mixing a lot of things together, a lot of tunes together too. That ends up happening as well, right? <laughs> That's very easy to do, but, but yeah, I think, well, especially when I play with you, my version ends up being a little bit more like yours. It's kind of, yeah, kind of blends in with yours a little bit. <laughs> so you. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great tune. Good square dancing tune. We usually play that at the square dances when, when we play at uh, Hallsville uh, and other dances. Um, Let's play a couple of tunes in A. We've played, been playing in the key of D, in case you're taking notes out there. Uh, we'll play a couple of old tunes in A. A is a great tune on all these instruments. And uh, this one is called Granny Will Your Dog Bite. <laughs> Sometimes the title is better than the tune. I, I don't think so. But this is Granny Will Your Dog Bite. And there are some raunchy words that go with it. Will not repeat them tonight. Close enough for the non symphony. Close enough for the non symphony, yeah. Uh, you might have not me doing this back a minute ago. Yep. That's a signal that we're going to quit after just a few more bars. Uh, since we're not using music, in fact, we don't read music in this kind of stuff. We don't need music, it's in our heads. We're ear musicians. We have to have some sort of wait to message the rest of the gang that the tune is coming to a close. So raising the foot is kind of dumb, but it works. You know, everybody sees you raise your foot. Sometimes I'll give them a look. You know, they'll, they'll, you know or they might think I'm just batty. But uh, sometimes a look will do it. Sometimes a gesture. Sometimes a little, some, little lick on the bow, you know, on the fiddle. Will, they'll say, oh, wait, we must be quitting. So. Anyway, that, that's what we're using tonight. Uh, go stay with it. Uh, this is called Granny Where Your Dog Bite. No child, no. Daddy cut his blinder off a long time ago.
Thank you. come from where mathematicians are. <laughs> hmm. The polka is from uh, Bohemia, really, and it's kind of a funny thing. This happens a lot in music where you hear something and you say, well, that's how Illinois people play, because it's not where we are. We're in Missouri, so an Illinois guy comes over and we say, we hear one tune and we say, that's how Illinois people play, and this happened in Bohemia. So they were dancing all these folk dances, and the Bohemians said, that folk dance is really Polish dance, because it's not from around here, but it took off in Bohemia. So this, this dance, the polka, came from, uh, came from Bohemia and spread all over. It became a very popular dance, along with the waltz, which you may have heard of, another big couple dance, very sexy, very sexy the waltzes. It was uh, not adopted very early because it was a little too sexy. <laughs> Three times, very, very close. Uh, the, the polka is a really upright dance. There's a lot of ways to dance. You can dance it as a couple. You can dance it as a big group. You see a lot of polka dancers, and, and Amber and I really learned how to play fiddle tunes in uh, the northern Midwest, northern Iowa, central Iowa. We learned a lot of Norwegian tunes and a lot of Danish tunes from our buddy Dwight Lamb of northwest Missouri. And the polka is the great, it's the powerhouse of all the dances because it has all this fire, and the dancers just jump straight up in the air the whole time, and you're so tired at the end. Uh, but it's got so much power, and it's a great couple dance, it's a great group dance. In my town that I grew up in, I was, I was a, in a Flemish community, and the dances that they would do there, the polka dance, would be in like a waterfall where all the gents would be on one line, all the ladies would be on the other line, and you'd meet whoever you danced with, whoever you met, you'd dance with down the length of the hall, and then you'd go back to the top, and whoever you met with, you'd dance down the hall again. It was like a constant mixer where you're always getting a new dancer, but it's a great way because then you don't have to bring a partner, you don't have to do anything about how to do it, you just have to be willing to try it. Is there anything you want to say about polkas, Amber? Let's play a polka. This is the Jenny Lind polka. Now, Howard is the expert on the Jenny Lind. I was not alive when Jenny Lind was, was brought to America by, uh, is it uh, P.T. Barnum, is that right? Uh, I was alive for the polka thing in you know, 1840 or whatever, but but Jenny Lynn was before my time, so uh, this is a popular polka, and give us a little bit about Jenny Lynn, just a little. Well, I think everybody knows something about Jenny Lynn, the Swedish nightingale, a uh, wonderful opera singer with a fascinating biography, Swedish, uh, grew up in an orphanage, and uh, was adopted by a very well-to-do family who gave her classical training in opera, and she sang all kinds of opera. This is 18... 20s and 30s and 40s, and was a smash hit all across Europe. And uh, at one point, you've heard of P.T. Barnum, he of Bunk and so on. Uh, Barnum had a great love of exhibiting interesting performers, you know, as you know, in his circuses and his museum in New York City. And he heard about Jenny Lind and just said, man, I got to get her over here. So in 1850, he uh, contracted with Jenny Lind to do a tour of the United States. Uh, and I think he paid in advance something like $190,000 in 1850 money and put it in her bank in London, convinced her to come. She had never been across the pond so he became her manager, and there are many funny stories about P.T. Barnum and Jenny Lynn. Uh, but she was a very strong young woman, of course, and uh, in a time when women were pretty much managed in every way you can think of by powerful men like P.T. Barnum. That's another part of the book, but uh, it's quite interesting that she did all the big concerts, you know, in Washington, Boston, Philadelphia, Miami, Havana. Cincinnati, Chicago, and then she said, what else could we do? And somebody said, well, we could go down to St. Louis. She 
He said, is there anything in St. Louis? I've never heard of St. Louis. And they said, well, yes, we have a wonderful hall there called Wyman's Hall, which is across where the old courthouse is now in downtown St. Louis. And it was built by a wannabe P.T. Barnum named Wyman, who had his own museum of crazy stuff, the Fiji mermaid, the alligator boy, crazy stuff in those museums. But so if they performed in Wyman's Theater, it was a great hit. And P.T. Barnum was a master of promotion. He would hire newspaper writers who actually were employed by newspapers to write puff pieces about three or four weeks before the concert. And by the time she actually came to town, she was a goddess. You know, you had to, you had to go see Jenny Lind. And people marketed all kinds of things by stamping them Jenny Lind, you know, handkerchiefs, buggy whips, everything you can think of. And of course, bedroom furniture that we still have today with the spool around it, you know, Jenny Lind beds. Really, leather gloves, fitted leather women's gloves and white kid. Anyway, it was kind of interesting. She did a wonderful concert, got paid, and then said, what else could we do? And she looked out, and there was nothing west of St. Louis that she wanted to see in 1850. This is before railroads were really active, and uh, so seven years, six years before Thespian Hall was built in Boonville, which she probably would have liked to play. She would have had to ride a steamboat. She was really tired of steamboats and carriages and just simply wanted to go home, so she did. So we didn't get Jenny Lynn, but this is a tune that is known as the Jenny Lynn Polka. Lots of different ways to play this. It, uh, a, a clever dancing master in New York in 1841 or so grabbed the melody and wrote his own music for it in like, you know, four or five flats and changes key every five seconds. Fiddle players do not do that. <laughs> we'll take a perfectly good tune and kind of simplify it into a good square dance piece or a good polka or a good waltz. This is why Missouri fiddle, no fiddlers I know play the complicated classical rags like the Scott Joplin stuff. It's from another planet. Just, you don't dance, anybody dance to Scott Joplin? Anyway, David, that's a sketch of too long, you say? Well, read my article, it's 48 pages. <laughs> <laughs> the parts are sometimes turned around and played in different order and so on, so sorry, David. <laughs> we try, but that, that's in book two, probably, how to do that. Uh, what are we going to play now? Well, according to our list, 
georgia camp meeting we have to talk a little bit about the ragtime era and their enormous influence in the fiddlers repertory a lot of times we play rags and really don't know that they came from the ragtime golden age this is one of the many many great rags composed by carrie mills the ragtime king i think i saw tom did i see tom verdo sneak in the back here a while ago where is tom tom you want to come talk about play this for us play it right just do it and tom verdo you might know is one of the area's experts on ragtime music and has a good band and so on and red wing yeah carrie mills red wing and a bunch of other great stuff too and we'll try to play it for you tom the best we know how in the key of d some people call it methodist camp meeting but georgia camp meeting and if you you know if you're going to listen to this stuff and then go right to google or youtube and download it it's not going to sound like that because we all play the stuff differently this is just how we play it This is quite a privilege for me, being with these kids up here. <laughs> these are the best musicians, probably in all of all of Elm Street, maybe. <laughs> maybe parts of Boone County, for all I know. But uh, if you play a fiddle, you know, and you're playing kind of the lead instrument, you know, the world's most precious thing is people playing with you who seem to enjoy it and know how to play. Wow. So I'm in hog heaven tonight. Thank, thank you guys for putting up with me. Uh, we do play a lot of waltzes in Missouri. I think more than some other states. Uh, we just have gobs and gobs of them. Uh, we'll play an old favorite. If you don't mind old favorites, do you? Uh, you know, not a test. This is called Over the Waves. I have played it a lot and uh, some people find it boring and hackneyed if you do <laughs> pardonnez-moi <laughs> so my grandfather's favorite waltz he played it all the time when i was a little kid and 
it the lodged itself in a part of my heart and i can't do anything about that and no i cannot play it like my grandfather i can't play it like anybody else but me although i picked up some of it from taylor mcbain ah my heroic mentor way back when i was about your age richard forty years ago so we'll play a little ways for this is composed by the way you know by a very interesting composer an otomi indian of mexican family connections who had a great orchestra they toured all over the country they had a long standing gig in miami and havana back in the twenties and thirties those were great places to perform in those two cities they love their waltzes down there so so this is composed by juventino rosas get that right now richard's checking me because at present he's living in oh how do you say it oaxaca oaxaca south of here a couple counties and teaching english down there and he he can barely speak english i don't know how i could teach him Thank you all. David was talking about the polka as a, a sexy dance and the waltz too. And uh, you know, once the uh, German speaking Europeans and maybe some Flemish also, you know, those folks got over here and waltzed like crazy. All the hillbilly Scotch Irish and Scottish people started doing it too. It was a lot of fun because you could squeeze your honey, you could touch them and compliment them in their ear and such things and hope for the best. <laughs> and uh, the waltz is a beautiful dance. I call it poetry. I don't want to repeat, you've probably heard this before, but I believe it. 
If you've ever seen a couple, uh, folks who have been married about 50 years, waltzing, and if they're good dances at all, that is my definition of poetry. The best thing you'll ever see in your life. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Turkey in the Straw is on the list. We might as well play that because it's on the list. Uh, I won't say that we practiced this because we didn't. Uh, and there's too many fish to herd down the stream to get all these folks together. We have played it quite a bit, and it's one of those great big fiddle tunes that every fiddle player you know uh, will be able to take a stagger at, whether they should or not. And it's one of our favorites, and it's another tune that a lot of people consider sort of maybe hackneyed or out of style or something, but that's the kind of tunes I, I tend to like and uh, maybe breathe some new energy into them. And a lot of different ways to play this tune, too, but you know, it's an old minstrel tune, it's, you know, from the pre-Civil War minstrel days. Uh, it has some words, too. The words are pretty funny, but time doesn't permit me to recite them for you. Later in the evening, I might. Uh, we only have a few more, and then we're going to have the Irish guys play. Uh, so this is Turkey in the Straw. Stop improving right now, okay? <laughs> You're going to be winning all the fiddle contests. Uh, well, we'll play, uh, what do we play now? How about another waltz? Shall we? Down in D? Yeah, yeah. This is another tune associated with the state of Missouri. Oh, Missouri, okay. Both are correct. It's a dialect, a social dialect. Okay. Uh, my family. Central Missouri say it both ways. Half the cousins say Missouri, and the other half say Missouri. They still manage to get together over Thanksgiving dinner. 
i don't know where this tune really comes from some have suggested that parts of the tune have some resemblance to the streets of laredo or something like that i don't i don't know you you could tell me if you know where it's from but it's a favorite that every fiddle player around missouri i've ever known plays this cowboy waltz and we like it too You know, in my first book, that undoubtedly you read many times, passed it around all over the world, I am sure, called Play Me Something Quick and Devilish, there's a whole chapter about Irish fiddlers in outstate Missouri. I say outstate Missouri because it's a different cup of tea in the big urban areas. And one of the great uh, collectors of Irish fiddle music way back in the 1860s and 70s actually lived in Edina, Missouri. He taught mathematics and wrote down some Missouri fiddle tunes while he was there. We're not going to play those tonight, but in case you're interested, Francis O'Neill, the great Chicago music publisher. Uh, but I've always had a, a good spot in my heart for the Irish players, and Columbia has a long tradition of Irish fiddling and music and Irish dancing, too, and I see some of the members of the Irish group out here in the audience. Uh, they get together every week and play. And so if we have any, are there any concertina players in the audience? <laughs> Young lady, would you get your box and come up here, please? <laughs> well, I'm gonna move my chair just a minute. We'll scoop back and give them our chairs. Uh, 
we have a trio and another musician we need is a guitar player and that's a fella Heinrich Leyenheim. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I'm going to get out of the way. We're going to hear some Irish music for a little bit. We're going to actually play a couple of horn pipes that were composed by a man from West Clare named Junior Freehand. Maybon and Stack of Rye. Stack of Rye. <laughs>
Shearer. Kitty O'Brien's, and what's the second one? First House in the Park. It's real. This is the uh, fiddle version of that lab experiment. 
We talked many times about all the tunes that we share with Irish players, and they're just gobs of them. Um, and we're going to play one of the great favorites, kind of wind up the show, and then we'll have Q and A and questions and so on in a couple of minutes. Uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, and by the way, thank you, Jim, for putting the trio together tonight. It was nice. Appreciate it. <laughs> Jim and I go way back, I should say, back to the 60s. I was not yet a professor, that's true. I was only dreaming of being a professor. And you were dreaming of graduating from high school. <laughs> And you did graduate. Yeah. Congratulations on that. A little late. But yeah. uh, thank goodness you gave that up. Uh, so the light. But one of the things I talk about a lot in the new book, which is called Keep It Over, uh, uh, is the 60s phase, you know, the folk music revival, folk song revival, whatever you want to call it. A lot of us in this audience were there. Dick and, uh, and we remember it. You know, we can remember the 60s, but there was a place called the Shea Coffee House in the basement of the Presbyterian Church that started in 1964. And a lot of us would gather down there and we met each other and played music. And Jim and I actually had a band with his brother, Lee Ruth. Never mind. I okay. can't repeat the name of it, but uh, can you imagine? playing in a band with Jim and Lee Ruth, on one on this side and one on this side. It was a lot of fun, and, and, and uh, we had a good time, Jim. Um, so this is McLeod's Reel, and I just happened to think that, is Laura Jolly here? Shame on Laura. I'll, I'll leave her alone. Uh, any, anyway, uh, Dr. Kramer, you have a really cool recording in the archives of of this tune, McLeod's Reel, played by uh, a, an Irish immigrant piper in New York City called Patsy Tui, and some fiddlers that I knew years ago in Saline County, Missouri, bought that 78 RPM record and learned it upside and down. It didn't sound at all like Patsy Tui playing it. They, turned it into a Missouri tune. This is the 1920s and 30s. And you have the original 78 back in the files that I've given you in the Bill Kearns collection. Ask for the Bill Kearns collection. Uh, but there are a lot of crossovers, you know, and this is just one of the tunes that crossed over and went back and came back and went back and still played a lot in sessions, both in Ireland and here. We played a lot here. You know, I think it, I think he plays a medley of tunes on that 78. As a matter of fact, and I can't think of who the tunes were, but I was astounded that Bill Kearns, who's now passed away, and when he presented his collection of old records and tapes for the for the archives, as well as his 1940 home recorder that he recorded his own 78 RPM record with, those are here too. I was astounded when he talked started talking about Irish fiddling, and here's a guy who I thought, well, you know. It, you know, what, what, how do we know about Irish fiddle? We really don't know that much about it, but he had read up on it and knew the whole history of it, and it's just a wonderful thing. And that's the thing about fiddle players, we're really complicated. We might play a lot of different styles that you're not expecting us to play. Uh, you know, I play a little swing. My friends can't stand to hear me do it, but I try to play swing. I play a lot of ragtime tunes, I play, you know, so we're very versatile. I don't think any of us up here are just one thing. You know, we're, we play, enjoy lots of different kinds of music. And one of the great things about today, uh, with let's say talking about YouTube and the internet and all this digital revolution, I talk about that in the new book too, is that in a way that's a good thing because while one of the problems with YouTube is if you learn a tune slavishly according to some particular player. You could get stuck there and never learn anything more. But what you could also do is punch in something, say, Kentucky fiddling. 
and start listening to ms to kentucky fiddle players or texas fiddle players so in a way you know the multi verse or the digital world has made it possible for us to dig out very local and regional tunes that we may never have heard of if it weren't for the internet so while i often complain about the misuse of the internet for for musicians there is an upside to it and you can find everything we're playing tonight on the internet so uh mcleod's real and then we'll have questions such a nice audience it's so nice to see some friends and neighbors and people i've known um, for decades out here as well some some young people like evan teeter who actually played very fine old-time banjo good to see you evan uh how many people here just for the heck of it play the fiddle come on be brave put them up there quite a, quite a few and including okay include violin <laughs> 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 it's the same instrument, we just do something slightly different with it. They tend to be in tune and such as that. So we don't, that didn't pause them. Okay, I need to read my... You're good. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, questions and answers. Or answer questions. And if you... You give us... Hand, I'll come by. Question. So we can hear the question. Anybody questions? I noticed that your fiddle is a lot darker toned than uh, a lot of others. So just wonder about the finish of them. Maybe people could talk a little bit about their instruments. That's a very good question. Uh, every violin is different. And every violin we know today is modeled on one of a half a dozen great instruments from the past. And I see Tom Bredow should really answer this question. Tom, you want to tell us about why the tone in this one's Supposedly darker than. Come on up and talk. 
By the way, you know, if you've got the book, you know all about Tom Perdoe, <laughs> Jeff City native. A guy that makes his own violins, never happy with somebody else's. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> there, there are more good makers in life right now than there have been in all of history. Um, Well, the varnish has nothing to do with it. You know, that's that's irrelevant. Uh, it, it, it's hard to say. It, it, a lot of it has to do with the wood. A lot of it has to do with the arching, the inside volume, the cavity makes a difference. Uh, bigger fiddles tend to be uh, more, you know, bassy. Uh, but the more you go that direction, the more you go dark, the more clarity you lose. So it, it's always a trade-off. Uh, but yeah, most of most of what gets bandied about about instruments, about fiddles and guitars and everything else, is just somebody's current fancy. Uh, everything makes a difference in how much. It's always hard to say. Anyone else? My goodness, class dismissed. Oh, what, what, sorry, sorry. Hi, Dale Smith. I know Dale. Hi, Dale. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Uh, this is supposed to be about the fiddle and associated instruments in old-time music, but um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how uh, historically singing might have been part of the picture in old-time music in the various sorts of... Uh, oh, sure. And of course, many of the tunes that we played tonight uh, have words to them, lyrics. As I mentioned, many of the composed tunes are also fiddle tunes. Uh, singing is usually not going to happen in a square dance, which is the main place that a fiddler might play. Uh, in certain jam sessions, you might sing something, but it's quite rare at the jam sessions I go to. We're pretty instrument-centric, uh, but like a lot of people, I have a you know, checkered past. I was a bluegrass player back in the 60s and tried to sing like Bill Monroe and play the mandolin when Jim and I met. And uh, so I could sing plenty of songs, but that somehow is kind of a different compartment in all the ch connected chambers of traditional music. That explain it well enough, or does anybody else want to help me out on that? No, no, no help is forthcoming. <laughs> is that, does that help at all, Dale? Uh, yeah, no, it's just, uh, it's just always been curious to me that, the, as you say, these songs, um, there are songs that are also meant to be sung, but when I, when I, I think of old-time music, and I'm not, in, I'm by no means any, an expert on it, all, I hear, I hear instruments, and I, I just like, when I, when I hear the tunes, I just know that there's words in there wanting to... <laughs> yeah, well, you know, as you well know, in the new book, which is called... There's a lot of discussion of bluegrass festivals and bluegrass music. And so at the same time, the folk song people were being with, you know, Joan Baez or Woody Guthrie or whatever they liked, you know. The bluegrass guys, you know, were playing Bill Monroe records and Flat and Scruggs records and singing. Uh, singing is a very powerful and crucial element in bluegrass music. Two, three part singing. And that's part of the definition of bluegrass. But the fiddle, Kind of, as I think of it in this particular context, is instrumental music for people to dance. So, in, in a way, it's a different function, you know, a different path, a different uh, purpose for the for the music. But I like singing too. You know, I don't sing anymore, but I do like it. Yeah. Well, that helps. No complaints, by the way. Oh, well, thank you, Dale. <laughs> Sessions, I'm the only one. And I'm wondering what where it plays in these. Well, the jam sessions jam sessions I go to, where did he go? Heinrich <laughs> plays mandolin. I used to play nothing but mandolin and banjo until I got the fiddle bug and then yikes and <laughs> grab me by the thumb. Uh, but mandolin is very important in old time music too. Uh, you know, one of the uh, 
editorial points of asking Asher to play tin whistle with us is that the way I think of old time fiddling, any kind of instrument that works is very welcome to me. And I like variety and I like to hear different kinds of instruments. And I like playing with other fiddlers. I would rather play with another fiddler because I like the interplay and I like playing harmony parts just about as much as playing the lead. So maybe I'm a little different in that regard. But the mandolin is very important. And in bluegrass music, no bluegrass band is going to make a dollar unless they've got a hot mandolin player. So yeah, this is just a slightly different phase in all those various phases in the universe of, of string music. Does that help at all? I love mandolin. I've got a couple for sale in case they have a really nice one. If you yes. I just wanted to say one thing about how bluegrass singing was explained to me by a mutual old friend of ours. Songs from the heart sung through the nose. <laughs> <laughs> Clever girl. Extra points on your final exam. You hear what she said? Songs from the heart sung through the nose. Now, <laughs> uh, you obviously weren't a Joan, Joan Baez addict like I was, <laughs> or any of those guys. Any other questions? Well, well, one more? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, uh, I've kind of always thought of the fiddle music as Irish, and you pointed out to us this evening that each area of the country kind of has their own techniques and stuff. Is the Missouri fiddle music then really probably extremely influenced by the Scots-Irish immigrants to our state? Or what other things contribute to that? Well, yes, sir. And that is a complicated question. Uh, the whole book number one sort of is addressed to that. All 600, 500 pages of that book. Yes, a lot of what we play does come from Scotland via Ulster in the colonial period. What we think of as Irish fiddling that we heard tonight, I would say, is a later phase, maybe even a 20th century phase. The Theta Famine from then on, 1848 on in the 40s. Uh, but the real inheritance that I look at here in this part of Missouri not the Ozarks, not talking about Baja, Iowa, but in this part of Missouri is Bluegrass, Kentucky, Northern Kentucky, and Piedmont, and Tidewater, Virginia. The other parts of those same places, the mountainous areas, the Appalachian, the Blue Ridge, that had more of an impact on Ozark fiddling. You could hear that in the repertoire. I think it, you can hear that in some of the styles of playing. Uh, the Little Dixie style, Central Missouri style, is a little more noty. Perhaps some have said it's more literate. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but uh, we could demonstrate, I hate to do this, but you want to demonstrate the difference? Well, yeah. 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 Play, play soft stroke something like pour the cabbage down. Then, well, I, I can do it with you. Gross stereotype time. <laughs> big, big stereotype. Gross oversimplification. The tune, let's say, uh, Boil a Cabbage Down. A lot of fiddlers, it's their first tune. Mostly what I think of is kind of a soft stroke style that I think in the older Ozarks players that I knew played it sort of like this. I don't hardly ever do that soft stroke because it's it's not endemic to the style I play, although certain tunes, like Ragtime Annie, demand it, or you're not playing the tune correctly. So I would play that tune here. Same tune, boil the cabbage down. So in other words, I guess they're going more for rhythm for dancers, and I guess I'm going for Carnegie Hall or something. I don't know what I'm going for, 
But a lot of people have said, yeah, that other style's better for dancing, and it may be, as far as I know. But that's the melodic, more the melodic style. It's more like our, or Scottish fiddling, really, than Bodinian, as I can think of. That's a really keen question. Thank you.